Welcome back to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. I am with the fabulous, one of the world's leading coaches, Chris Howard. Now, Chris Howard has achieved extraordinary success as a social entrepreneur, transformational speaker, author, coach, and lifestyle and wealth strategist in a career spanning over two decades. Chris's lifelong mission has been to put the tools of transformation into the hands of everybody on the planet and to create worldwide wealth through education and entrepreneurial means. On the entrepreneurial side, his seminars and products have generated well over $100 million in sales globally. He has personally done million dollar sales days over and over and over again. One of the most popular speakers in the world, Chris has spoken in 28 different countries and 57 different cities, often with individual exclusive audiences of thousands. Chris has touched over a million people's lives through his teaching, and I'm one of them, by the way, and yeah. programs, and is known for both his heartfelt approach to transformation, as well as his ability to help people to rapidly transform their businesses and their lives for the better. Chris has enjoyed spending his time over the years in philanthropic, oh, that was a, that's a challenging word for me, efforts, such <laughs> as bringing a, a group of 30 coaches and mentors to, to work with the students at CIDA, the first free university in South Africa, that's amazing. Building a high school in Peru and working with Friends International to help get free children off the streets in Cambodia and developed for greater possibilities in life. That is just absolutely fabulous. So welcome the amazing Chris Howard. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. I have to ask, am I the only person who tries to read the books on your back wall behind you? Like I'm trying to like- No, because I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I've, t I've taken something off the wall actually to show you. Uh -huh. Hey, right. So those of you that are listening and not Everybody. seeing, I've got CDs from Chris. I don't know what year that is. It's actually showing my age and yours, Chris. And, uh, <laughs> this one. Yeah, yeah. Both one. of those. Yeah, we're looking 2009, 2010, somewhere in that time frame, that, probably. Yeah, and I listen to them over and over and over again. So thank you so much for everything that you give to the world and what you've given me. I, I loved going to your event in Australia last year, I think it was. Uh, so thank you for everything. You that again, you yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get into the coaching world? Coaching world. Um, well, you know, I've always been a, a teacher at, at heart, I think. Um, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I was teaching, I, I was always in the martial arts. I was teaching children's martial arts when I turned 12 or 13. So I was teaching the younger kids. Um, then uh, when I turned 18, I went and I worked for a company called Club Med, a, a hotel resort chain, and I became a sports instructor there. So I taught windsurfing. I uh, taught sports, sailing. Uh, I later became in charge of all the sports, but I was always teaching. Um, and then when I left Club Med, I was 24 years old and I desperately wanted to make my life work in the, in the quote unquote real world because I had been in a resort environment up until that time. <clears throat> and so I dove into personal development out of desperation more than anything else to make my life work. Uh, and as I dove into personal development, it became real clear that, uh, you know, speaking and coaching were closely akin. Um, and so I thought, well, this is what I've always been doing. Uh, let me, let me continue that path. I, I was 25 years old, uh, years old at the time. I'm 50 years old this year. Um, so that was 25 years ago and wow. haven't looked back. Yeah. And when you started coaching, I'm imagining, cause even when I was coaching, when you would have started coaching, it would have been a new sort of thing. You know, did you have people saying, what do you need a coach? What do you need a coach for? What is coaching? Well, I mean, I mean, you being in Australia, like coaching is much more widespread in Australia. I mean, it's starting in the States as well. It's starting, we're starting to get that. But in Australia, you've had some legitimacy around coaching for a while. I mean, it's been like considered a, a legit profession and stuff. I, I hear what you're saying there, but we get that even more in the States. Um, but yeah, when I was starting, uh, I, I remember, well, 
I, I remember there was just very little legitimacy to the field even uh, back when I was starting. And, um, and so it was kind of an uphill uh, battle from there. But I got real clear in the early days that uh, I wasn't going to focus on, hey, Chris, the coach. I was going to focus on what's the value I'm delivering to the, to, to the person I'm working with. You know, you want to make your life work. I've got some great technology that can help you do that. And, and that's kind of how I position myself right from the beginning with a focus on uh, the, the end result and the technology. And, uh, and then I got removed from the equation as being uh, a part of the uh, discussion even. Uh, so that was, that was the way I started in the early days. Now, uh, I know people are quick to brand themselves as a coach or brand themselves as that. I, I have a hard time branding myself as anything because I feel that any, any uh, label you put on yourself limits you in some way, um, and maybe that's limiting. But uh, So I, I, I suppose I am a coach. I suppose people call me a coach. I, I know I've trained a lot of coaches, trained thousands and thousands over the years. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've thought of it a little bit differently as I've come along the path. Yeah. And you're one of the masters of NLP. And I know when I first started to learn about NLP, it was for me from an outsider, it was like, what is this NLP? It's like, is this like magic? Is this like, how would you explain NLP? Um, you know, uh, just a, a hybrid blend of cognitive and behavioral psychology that became popularized in the late 60s, early 70s. And there was also at the, at the same time, it, when you think about it, I mean, when you go, go back and you look at Freudian type talk therapy, it took up to seven years to have any type of result. So there was this, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was this emergence and this trend of people looking to to do rapid therapy looking to get results faster which had previously existed i mean freud was a hypnotist before he became before he developed psychoanalysis so rapid therapy had existed in therapy throughout time but late 60s early 70s there was uh, this resurgence of a, a a need to produce results in a shorter period of time um at the same time uh, you had this guy, Bandler, uh, who was uh, basically a computer scientist going to school at the University of Santa Cruz. Another guy uh, who was a professor of linguistics named Grinder. Um, the two of them were at, at Santa Cruz, and they said, well, let's look at a lot of these rapid forms of therapy that exist out there in the marketplace, and also let's, let's put a metaphor around this, and let's liken a human being to a computer, because computers were all rage. It was late 60s, early 70s. This mm -hmm. was this new emerging technology. Well, how are human beings like computers? And that's where the notion of programming came from. And, um, and uh, so it was saying, how do we work with a human being, use the metaphor of a human being like being like a computer so you could change the programming, upgrade the software and that sort of thing, and use some of these rapid forms of transformation and put it into this all-purpose self-improvement technology, which ended up taking on the name uh, NLP uh, or Neuro Linguistic Programming. Neuro meaning having to do with the mind and the nervous system. Linguistic is the language and programming would be the programs that we run that either produce results that we like or results that we don't. Um, so if somebody uh, consistently produce a re produces a result of depression, well then the notion would be that there's a program that they're running and we could change that program to a program for happiness or upgrade the software. Um, so that was the, that, that was where that was born from. And it was a really a hybrid blend of a lot of different things that were, uh, were out there at the time. A lot of it was based on, um, anthropology as well as, uh, various forms of linguistics, general semantics, which came from a guy by the name of Alfred Korzybski, um, who was the person who first coined the term neuro linguistics. He gave us that. Um, and, uh, so it was a, it was a blend of a lot of different stuff that was out there in the marketplace at the time became very popular, um, very, uh, uh, very powerful set of tools for managing your own mind, uh, and helping other people to manage their minds. How's NLP helped you personally? Um, over the years, you know, like it was the, it was the first real big science that I dove into for transformation. So I use a lot of different tools uh, in these days and, uh, because my, my notion is, is that a human being is much more than a computer. Um, so metaphors, while they have usefulness to take us from the known to the unknown, um, they also have their own limitations. Um, if I say that life is like a uh, box of chocolates, 
Um, that metaphor has some usefulness because then we can understand the concept of you never know what you're going to get and yeah. surprise and that sort of thing. But then at some point that metaphor runs its limit uh, in terms of the usefulness. The uh, I don't believe that human beings are computers. I believe we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, and we utilize our mind-body apparatus to navigate the playing field of life. So your body is like the vehicle or the, you know, the body temple. Um, that's a tool uh, that we house ourselves in. And how we take care of that's going to make a difference and an impact in terms of the results that we produce. And then we've got our mind. And neurolinguistics is a great set of tools for running the mind. And the mind is another, uh, another tool for making manifest the reality that we want to make manifest in our life. So um, I think in order to understand ourselves fully, we have to go much deeper than just the mind or just looking at ourselves as the programs that we run and stuff like that. Um, but um, learning how to work your mind and manage your mind is one of the most important things that you'll ever learn because it is your uh, medium for producing results in the material world. Yeah, absolutely. And, with and, your... and and just specifically, how has it changed things for me? I mean, it helped me to go from uh, being $70,000 in debt to making, uh, you know, $100 million in sales. It helped me going, uh, it helped me uh, to, to get out there and really look at, uh, probably one, I think one of the greatest gifts that I took from it and, and has played out in my life was the gift of, of modeling, of breaking down because um, that's one of the notions that it was born from, was that any result that somebody else produces has structure to it. And if we break that structure into manageable chunk sizes, we can transfer it to ourselves. We can replicate that result in a fraction of the time that it took the original expert to do. Um, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. It looked like my computer went wacko for a second. But if you're there, I'm good. I'm here. Um, <laughs> so, um, and don't our minds do the same? Right, yeah. don't our minds do the same? And so, uh, along the way, uh, it helped me to uh, to model, to extract results, to replicate it. So I transformed my financial situation. Uh, I, it was the base model upon which I built my seminar business as I grew, um, and uh, that combined with the sum total of all the other things that I've done over the years. Because, like I say, there there have been a number of different things that I've added to the mix that have made. Uh, that have made huge breakthroughs that I wouldn't have made it through life without either. And I would say it's absolutely in a, a top ranking of the tools for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you've built an amazing business, an amazing brand being you. What, what's been the biggest challenges for you over the years? Um, biggest challenges, I mean, it depends on what phase of life we're talking about, right? So uh, I think every decade probably had its own challenges. I can say that now because I've been doing it for a couple of decades. <laughs> <laughs> so every decade, I mean, uh, the original challenges when I was starting was, uh, the original challenge was just getting myself on the map and getting out there and breaking through the noise was probably one of the big challenges I had. Um, learning how to monetize my passions was another big challenge I had that I had to break through along the way. Um, learning how to uh, build uh, the team that could uh, you know, really make that dream work um, uh, was the next big challenge. Um, dealing with competition, dealing with uh, things that you wouldn't expect in the personal development space. Um, egos, personalities, people coming in. Uh, um, you know, uh, bad seeds uh, within the mix that uh, uh, that would seek to destroy rather than to build. There's people like that along the path that we run into, and you got to know how to deal with those things. And so um, uh, there were learning experiences every step of the way. Um, and then, of course, uh, as you and I were discussing just before you, we started here, um, you've got modern day challenges that everybody, that are universal challenges that everybody are dealing with now, such as the pandemic and how do I deal and how do I, uh, you know, how do I re-express this in the way that's going to be most powerful um, with the, given the constraints that are there and then how do I manage that in relationship to everything else. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been a number of different challenges uh, throughout the years, but as, as has been said, uh, within every challenge is the seed of a greater opportunity. And I really believe that to be so. And when we look for those opportunities, um, they can be the greatest times of growth. They can give us uh, 
they can put us in a position that we would have never created had we not had that challenge. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, be speaking to you right now, Chris, <laughs> if, if the pandemic didn't happen. I mean, it's an right. awful thing that's happened, but there yeah. is also change and growth and um, creativity. If you're not sitting in fear, there's this creativity that you can have um, and you look at things differently, which I think is is the, a great thing from an awful situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just teaching... I have an online course I just, uh, I taught the last session of today called Wealth Consciousness 101. And I was uh, talking about just that, that topic. And I asked everybody to think of a challenge that they're faced with right now. And just simple exercises to, you know, write down the 10 things you appreciate most about it. And by the time you get down to those 10 things, you're looking at all these benefits that you got from this challenge or could get, or you could take advantage of, which just shifts your consciousness to opportunity instead of challenge. And when we're and what we focus on expands. Um, so, you know, what we think about, we bring about, as, as we know. And so when you shift your focus like that, um, your whole world can change in the flash of an eye. And, and you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of people are needing to change their worlds right now. But it, it does come down to what are you focused on. Yeah, absolutely. And how have you changed? Like, if you think about when you first started as a coach and a business owner, yeah. right back then and then who you are today how have you changed who have you grown into um i got more bruises and bumps and broken bones and <laughs> no, i'm just joking <laughs> actually not so much but um just from no, coaching uh, how have I changed? <laughs> um, you know i would say in the early days because like when i started i was you know, 24 25 years old and i was willing to burn the midnight oil work 24 hours a day uh, just work around the clock um, in what I perceived to be my one go and my one shot at this that I was going to will into existence. Uh, and there's something to be said for that, that youth and that energy and that desire and that, um, that passion and that willingness to do more than anybody else is going to do. Um, and so those were probably my strengths then. Now, my strengths have changed now. So now my strengths are uh, wisdom, uh, the ability to look, at, the ability to uh, leverage, get more result with less effort. Uh, it's interesting, you know, in jujitsu that I've done jujitsu for uh, 13, probably 15 years, something like that, 20 years maybe even. Um, now I've been a martial artist all my life, but they say the older you get as a martial artist, the more you have to rely on good technique. You have to rely on. Uh, you know, because in jujitsu, it's a wrestling art with joint locks and submissions. And if I'm wrestling with somebody that outweighs me by 200 pounds, which are, let's say, you know, by 60 kilos, 60, 70 kilos, uh, and, uh, so, and, and, and is younger than me, is, you know, 10, 20 years younger than me, um, then I have to rely on technique. I have to be sharp. I have to be, rely on leverage. I have to rely on, on little tricks. I have to be trickier in my approach to things so I can get much more result with much less effort. Um, and, uh, and so you learn how to do that in martial arts is a, a, when you think of the master and a good friend of mine is his name's Hickson Gracie, who is one of the greatest fighters of all time. He had 400 undefeated matches. And, uh, and I remember having a conversation with him in Brazil at one point, and he said, you know, Chris, it's time for me to become the master because the fighter can't always be the fighter. There's always going to be somebody bigger, badder, tougher. There's always going to be, you know, so you have to, you have to change and shift your self-concept. And so I guess uh, it would be something similar to that, that my self-concept has shifted. I can produce a better result with less effort because I understand where exactly to, uh, you know, where to step and where to apply that pressure and, um, so you learn things and the more knowledge and experience you have, the more you can do that. So um, I would say that I also have different ideas about creation. I, I don't really think that we will things. I mean, it's possible to will something into existence, but I think of more uh, co-creating and working with the forces of nature. And uh, it's, I think of uh, business building more like gardening at this point where you don't will the garden, you will the flowers to grow to a certain height or will the trees to look a certain way. You work with what there and you trim it until you create a masterpiece and when we take that kind of uh view on creation or uh, uh or co-creation even if you will because we got to work with the seasons we got to work with what we're what it is that we're given then it becomes more of a fluid uh working model rather than a uh, fighting 
uh, model. And I think that we, you know, for me, at least as you get older, you're almost forced to take positions like that. And it's, and it's a good shift. You know, yeah. it's once again, where you can find those opportunities um, to be able to create in more powerful ways because a little leverage at the right place will beat every time a lot of brute strength uh, with, no, uh, with no focus. Yeah. Do you feel, for me, I know that in my time in business, when I first started, it was like I was pushing. It's like I'm always pushing, pushing, pushing. Whereas now that I'm older, it's like I trust more and let go more. Does that, do you relate yeah, to that at working all? Working with, yeah, I think, I think yeah. that's uh, a kid really akin to what I'm, what I'm saying as well. It's like yeah. you've got to work with what's there, um, which requires trust and faith and yeah. uh, belief. And, and it's easier to have trust and faith and belief if you've done it a few times and you know what works and you know what you're capable of and you know what, uh, you know, when you're, when you're out there and you don't know anything and you're fresh, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? Well, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do everything. And then, you know, maybe 5% of that action produced 95% of the results. Um, whereas now once you, you've identified what those 95% of results come from, you can take comfort in that. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think all those things, uh, come into play. Uh, but I'm definitely, mellower than I was back then. And that's got to come as a result of faith. And it doesn't mean that I've got it all the time. Doesn't mean that I don't find myself in places of fear. Doesn't mean that I don't find yeah. myself in those, you know, I, I, I do just like anybody else. Um, but they they don't last as long and, uh, and I'm able to navigate that. And, um, you know, I, I read someplace at one point, you've got to, as, as time goes on, you have to learn how to not quit and just rest along the way. So I've learned about that along the way, how to rest along the way so I don't push myself into non-existence or oblivion, um, which a young person is apt to do because they're, they're immortal, right? Whereas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like, yeah, I think I'm going to rest a little bit there. And then you just, and you can slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember in, uh, in Australia anyway, there's this ad and it's, um, it's a codrel, like a, a Panadol or, you know, a medicine ad. And it's like, you know, soldier on with codrel. It was called codrel and you just soldier on with codrel. Okay. And I used to love that ad, Chris, because that was me. I would be <laughs> sick as a dog and I'd continue and I'd, I'd just keep going. Um, and now I look at relaxation. I think this, I, I put it in my mind as I'm rejuvenating right now to get me more energy to go again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah no kidding. Absolutely. Yeah. What uh, would you uh, say? That, that reminds me of that chopper statement. I can't say it here, but it was like harden the something up. Oh yeah. You can say it here. You can, <laughs> you say, can say it here. Yeah. You can say whatever you want here. <laughs> what, um, with, uh, with an entrepreneur, what, what for a successful entrepreneur, what do you think, what attributes do you think they need? Um, w vision, for sure. I mean, you've got to have vision to be an entrepreneur. Um, you have to have uh, passion, um, desire, uh, the uh, faith, right? So that goes right back to Napoleon Hill talked about desire and faith and the fusing yep. of those two emotional states. Um, but for me, faith, we, we use the term faith, but faith to a lot of people uh, feels more like hope. Um, so the, like, I think for me, desire and certainty, the certainty, the belief that, uh, which to me is faith, yeah. right? So uh, desire, certainty, passion. Uh, and I think part of what gives you the certainty is the willingness to go the distance, the, um, the long-term view, not the short-term view. If you've got yeah. a short-term view, and you're only willing to stick it, stick with it as, until you get your first successes. And if you don't see those successes right away, you're gone. That person just doesn't go the distance. It's the person who makes the decision early on. This is the life for me. This is what I'm going to do. This is my path. And there is no swaying from that. A lot of the fear disappears the moment you take that long-term view because there's nothing yeah. to be afraid of at that point. You, you're yeah. on the path. And then as uh, Paulo Coelho said in the book, The Alchemist, and every moment of every day is a moment spent in the embrace of God because you're doing what you're born to do. You're following your heart, yeah. which I think is really, really important um, for the entrepreneur uh, to follow their heart. Um, we just hear that everywhere from every successful entrepreneur that's ever existed. They're going to tell you the same thing. 
And that's because that's the fuel in the engine. And if you don't have the fuel, you won't stick with it long enough to be truly financially successful. Yeah. And I think it's so easy to, to be a great leader or a great business owner or to be seen as a great business owner when times are good. Mm. It's when times are really challenging. And I've really noticed this with COVID where yeah. some people are just, just in fear or you don't even see them anymore. It's like they've dropped off the, <laughs> the, the face of the earth and then other leaders are stepping up They're They're seeing things differently. Um, and we've seen that with, with different businesses in the past, like Kodak, who, you know, that they thought they had the market in regards to, you know, taking pictures and, and then, you know, not thinking that we'd have pictures on our phone. <laughs> you know? right. um, and so I, I think that it, when it's a challenging times, and this is what I tell myself is that I'm learning so much right now. I'm growing so right. much right now. Who do I want to be right now? And yeah. When I look back in 12 months time and look back at the pandemic, what, what type of person was I? Did I step up and am I proud of that? Mm. Um, so how, in regards to COVID, how have you had to adapt with your business? Um, well, I mean, the live seminars aren't happening, right? At this, yeah. at this time, um, when we're doing this interview. Um, th so that's changed everything. That's, uh, you know, obviously. Um, but it's also created a lot of opportunity. You, you know, a lot is happening online now. Um, I wanted to build online for a long time, but I was teaching so much. I was on the road, uh, you know, sometimes in three different time zones a week and just traveling back and forth and teaching, teaching, teaching. And um, it's a rewarding model, but it's also exhausting. And you can find yourself at the, the end of 10 years, having just bounced around like a pinball for 10 years, um, and so this, uh, this time gives me an opportunity to build something that, um, can help people, whether I'm physically present or not. Um, and, uh, we have some real exciting things happening. I mean, we built, uh, multiple, uh, e-courses and things like that, that people can go through that teach every aspect of the speaking business that teach, you know, I said, I just finished this wealth 101 course teaches wealth consciousness. That was a 15 hour deep dive. We're going to start wealth 201, uh, uh, in, in a bit, in, a, in about a week and a half. Yeah. And August 17th, I saw it on your, on your website. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's wealth consciousness 201. <laughs> That's another 16 hour deep dive. So I'm doing all these deep dives into various elements of things that make our life work. And I can provide those at, uh, for people at a cost that, uh, you know, that I don't have to charge them for my time. I don't have to charge them for the seminar venue. I don't, so we can reduce the rates on those and we can get learning out to people in a much more uh, palatable way from a financial perspective and a doable way that allows people to uh, really move ahead. So I think that the value we're able to create uh, because of the free time, I'll call it free time. It's not because I've been working harder than I ever have. Um, but that's not actually true. I've been working hard. Um, but uh, in this uh, space of time, I've been able to uh, create a lot more value for a lot of people uh, in new ways. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing that. Uh, I, enjoy the, I, I enjoy conceptualizing the structure of what we're creating in cyberspace that can serve people in a far more powerful way. And at some level, deep inside, I always knew that uh, that was the path, but day-to-day -day life uh, was getting in the way of actually being able to create it. We're able to create yeah. it now. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking before we, before we started this uh, podcast recording that I don't, did you feel, cause I love my live events. I absolutely <laughs> love them, Chris. And, and I'm a hugger. So I'm not, like, where's the <laughs> hugs? I can't hug anyone. It's like, Oh, I can't even give you a hug, Chris and say hello. <laughs> and for me, there was a, there, when, when the pandemic happened, um, the first word I said was, was fuck. <laughs> it's like, fuck. Uh, and I felt like I was trying to hold on to what I had. And so looking at what I had and what I built up, and even though like you, I had had some online stuff and I knew that that's where I needed to head more, but it was like, I really wanted to hold on to what I had. And so there was this transition that I had mentally that it was like, okay, I've got to 
really decide and I've got to let go of some stuff or change some stuff. It was a bit of a transition for me. Did you feel that as well? Yeah, it's the vacuum law of prosperity yeah. and action, right? And, the, and nature abhors a vacuum. When you want new clothes, you got to clean out the closet, make space for them. And so when you, and this closet cleaning came by necessity, not by uh, choice, perhaps. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you got this new space to fill in with, with greater good. And that's exciting. Um, yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah. So I, I think it's really kind of a, an interesting point in time. I mean, we see all the, you know, the, the death and, and stuff that's resulted from all yeah. of this. So like, I, I don't want to trivialize that when I um, say that this is a great time of opportunity yeah. and from a thought perspective and from how we manage our own states of mind and emotion, we want to focus on the opportunity. You don't want to go into the, you know, so what we focus on expands. So there's tremendous opportunity right now. And, and that's exciting. There's yeah. we have the opportunity to change in ways that uh, we maybe never would have before. I talked to somebody on the phone and she said uh, just recently, she said her husband uh, had been working a job that he never liked. And now all of a sudden, his job disappeared. So he had no choice but to dive into and start doing what he always said he said he wanted to do, yeah. which was launch his own online business, which is the thing that can set him free. Um, so, so the opportunities are absolutely there if we grab them and if we choose to use the time wisely, like you said before, and become, you know, it's who we become in this process. Um, and, and that's an, ex that's an exciting, uh, opportunity. There's, uh, uh, I have been taking more classes than I've ever taken before at this uh, stage. Like all, uh, you know, like I think I'm enrolled. I have a class right after this that I've, I've a three hour class. I'm going, jumping right into right after this. Um, but I've got, uh, it'll be my, uh, you know, I've got six probably different cl courses that I'm taking right now, continuing to expand myself. I'm building on a regular basis. I'm having to restructure everything. And I think that your attitude is going to be the thing that defines you through times like this, because you know, there's people that let, allow the, the situation to depress them, to get them down, to spiral them downward. And there's other people that go, wow, here, here's this new playing field. You know, if you weren't doing well before, now nobody is. So the playing field's even. <laughs> <laughs> So you, get, you, you, you just, they, they, they started the race, you were way in the behind, and now they say, hey, we're starting again, and we're going to put you right up here with everybody else. It's like, wow. And they, the biggest businesses are the ones that are having the biggest problems because they, they, they lost more. They have bigger infrastructure. They have to support yeah. more people. They have to, so the little people, yeah. the people that have small businesses, uh, we're, we're more, uh, you know, we're, we're more movable. We, we, we can respond to things better in many cases. Yeah. So it's, we want to take advantage of the opportunities that are here. There's definitely yeah. lots of them. And one of the things I'm really focused on, I know with my clients is, is of course our mindset in empowering that because there's so much out there, particularly in the media. Uh, even as, as I mentioned before, this podcast, Victoria in Australia is, is now deemed as, the state of disaster, you know, just even right. the language. And yeah. you listen to, I don't listen to, to the, I will get what I need out of the news and then I switch it off yeah. because as you know, most of it to sell is negative. Um, so we only hear one side of the story. And so mm -hmm. filling our minds with all of that uh, cannot empower us. And so for me, I'm always looking at what I'm putting in my mind. And as yeah. you said, with all of the trainings that you're doing right now and your self-development that you're doing, that's so important to me. Uh, what would you yeah. be, what, what would you, what advice would you give for, for entrepreneurs and business owners right now going through COVID? Well, I would, I think two things that would relate directly to what you're talking about. We've we got to yeah. remember that the, the nature of the conscious mind is impression. The nature of the unconscious mind is expression. So whatever we impress the unconscious mind with, we're going to express outward, uh, outwardly. And what we radiate is what we create. What we radiate is what we attract. And so neurobiologists these days say it's only, it's only about 5% of who we are that one would consider to be conscious. The yeah. other 95% is unconscious. But your conscious mind is like the captain. The unconscious mind is the crew. What you, what you impress your unconscious mind with is what's going to express outwardly into the world. Yeah. You're the gatekeeper. It's your choice what you want to bring in, whether you want to sit and watch the news and look at all the, the shitty, crappy things that are happening 
and, and impress your unconscious mind with that. Or if you want to do your vision boards and you want to do your visualization and you want to do your uh, positive self-talk and you want to take the time for your meditation and for your hypnosis and to program your own mind in the most powerful way and to read great books and surround yourself with people that are getting things done and to manage your states of mind and emotion and raise your states. If that's what you're doing and you're impressing positive stuff, great positive stuff's going to come out. So, so I would say make sure that uh, the best piece of advice is to make sure that you're being a good captain for your crew and that you're being a good gatekeeper in terms of what you're impressing. And it's not just a gatekeeper, it's also a, a, an accumulator of those things that you're going to impress with, uh, with purpose and with volition so that you can create what you want. Good, good stuff goes in, good stuff comes out. Absolutely. Um, Gobby Jean, yeah. Gobby Jap. <laughs> Gobby Jean, Gobby Jap. Yes, that's the first one. And then the other one would be, uh, I had a friend of mine um, uh, who had, you know, he's, if you've seen the movie, The Count of Monte Cristo, in the, I don't know if you saw that. Did you see that? I've, I saw a clip. I used to use a clip when I used to be a trainer for a business, a funny clip. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah, cool. you got to watch the, the whole movie was great. It's with James yeah. Carvizio and with... Um, uh, Richard Harris, uh, was a, you know, classic actor, and then also with uh, one of your own. I think uh, Guy Pierce is an Aussie, isn't he? Yes, I think he Guy is. Guy Pierce is an Aussie. Yeah, so Guy yeah. Pierce was in that. Um, and uh, so great movie. But in the movie, uh, the character Dantes, Edmund Dantes, gets wrongly imprisoned for 13 years, and uh, he's put there by his enemies. Uh, who then take his wife, take his riches, take everything that he would have had, rob him of everything. And he's in this prison for 13 years. And while he's in that prison, all he wants is revenge. And he wants, you know, and he's uh, carving into the walls, God will give me vengeance. And then he meets this old man in there, uh, played by Richard Harris, who teaches him how to fight, teaches, the guy didn't know how to read when he went in, teaches him how to read, teaches him how to think, how to think strategically. Um, he elevates who he was when he came in. And so uh, when he leaves there, he takes on this persona of the Count of Monte Cristo. He was just, uh, before going in, he was a sailor. Coming yeah. out, he's now the Count of Monte Cristo. And it, help, it helps that he, the old man gave him a treasure too. That always helps. So if you can find somebody like that, they give you a treasure. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but he used that 13 years and he emerged like the, the caterpillar, the, the butterfly emerging from the cocoon. So yeah. he, the way, what, and, and that's the point, is how, did, how do you use the time when you're imprisoned? Whether that be from a virus, whether that be uh, from a set of circumstances, whatever it is, what do you do with that time? Are you going to come out and be a, an infinitely more powerful version of yourself, uh, like in the Count of Monte Cristo, or are you going to wither away? And yeah. that choice, because I think it really is a choice, Yep. that choice will be what defines the rest of your life. So uh, to a, an entrepreneur, you know, be aware of what you're putting in, but then also be aware of the choice of your making of who you're going to become through this process, uh, like you had alluded to before. And um, if you use this process really wisely, um, you could come out in a far better position than you ever were when you went in in terms of perhaps what you created with your company or whatever with your business, um, if you're if you're able to uh, th think think of things in new ways and contemplate things and, and, and dream up new plans and new visions of the future, but then also who you are uh, can come out in a much more powerful place. That's why I'm taking all these classes. I'm taking uh, acting classes and speaking classes, performance classes, and all sorts of writing cl classes and. Uh, uh, sketch comedy classes, all sorts of stuff to help me to improve okay. myself as a, as a performer, as a teacher, um, and as a beacon of light. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting that I'm talking to you right now and you're saying these things because I've just said to some of, some of the people that you I just said the same that, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that, that there's a couple of classes that I want to do, which is acting classes and comedy classes. Uh, and also poetry, I was thinking, because as nice. our craft, I think poetry is, is so powerful as well. So for the, for the other thing that you mentioned in regards to the story that you said about the being in jail, I just recently saw just a really quick, quick thing in, in one of the books I read. And it said, you know, there's two people in jail and one looks out and they see the mud 
And then the other one looks out and sees the stars. And they're both right because they can both, there's, there's mud there and there's stars there. And yeah. so it's what we see, what we look at and what we see. And then we, what, what we focus on is often what we get. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and the problem with it is it seems, it seems trite. It seems yeah. like, oh, so simply said, yeah, right. But few people really grasp the relevance of putting it into practice. Because when you put it into practice, your world can change. You know? Yeah. And then some people also, they get this, they get something out of looking at the mud. Yeah. Because they can 100%. continue to be the victim mentality or whatever it is for them. They, they can love, stay in the mud. They get out of work, they get paid, they get whatever it is. Yeah. And then they've yeah. got excuses oh. of why not they're succeeding or achieving whatever in their world. So, um, so I love, I really love that analogy with mentors. And you've been one of my mentors for, and you didn't even know it. Oh, <laughs> you know, you've been in my car yeah. since I remember when I first got my, my car that had a CD player <laughs> and a car phone. I was, I thought I was so good. And um, I remember, and I was doing big long trips cause I was training people all around um, in country, country areas. And I would listen to your CD. So you were such a mentor of mine, even when you didn't, I hadn't met you yet. Oh, uh, so who have been your mentors? You know, I've had a number of them along the, along the way. I think um, um, you know, I'd go back to my martial arts instructors, you know. Uh, it's interesting because you see all this black lives matters is real big in the United States right now. You yeah. see all these things that are happening where people are coming out and, and, and I think that, you know, you know, my martial arts instructor was a black man that was, that made such an impact in my life from an early age. And so like, I've never thought of race. I don't, I don't think of that. I don't look at see two different colors or three different colors. Yeah. I see just everybody as being the same, but I guess it was the way that I was raised or where I grew up and the people I grew up with. But, I think of how fortunate I am for the, the men of color in my life that have, you know, that have made an impact in terms of and my, one of my other martial arts instructors, as a black man as well. They were actually partners and, and I ended up training with the other one later on. But my martial arts instructors uh, really helped to form who I would be and probably more so than, than anybody. Um, my instructors, and I started, there was a, a guy that I trained with, a guy named Owen Watson, who was my first instructor. And he really helped to formulate my, the discipline that I have, the way that I approach life, the way that I approach a goal, all those things came from him. Um, and uh, later on, my, my martial arts instructors would change. You know, I trained with the Gracies and uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu and they had a completely different attitude, but their attitude and philosophy around life has pervaded everything uh, that I do. And the, those, I always tell people that more important, you know, I teach personal development, but more important than any personal development tool you'll ever learn is the attitude with which you apply those tools. And um, you've heard before, the problem's not the problem, the problem's your attitude about the problem. Yes. So attitude is everything. Yeah, and that to me came to me from, from martial arts and from those, uh, those places. And then as I was growing up, I had people that I really looked up to in the hotel resort industry. There were a couple of people that worked there that were, um, they were, they were incredible leaders. They were visionaries. They made the whole engine run, but at the same time they were performers. So they'd sing on stage, they play guitar and they do shows at night. And so that inspired in me the whole performance side of things. And, uh, then when I came into the world of personal development, there were just, I mean, all the classics, reading the classics in personal development, but, but right back to thinking, grow rich. And then Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And then I went to go work for Dale Carnegie Training for a while. And my boss there was an incredible uh, mentor, an incredible guide. Um, and so personal development, I certainly had, there were certainly shining lights within the field that I looked at. And I thought, boy, I want just a little bit of that, you know, or just a little bit of that and borrowing from different people. And, um, and then looking at uh, billionaires, like when I was modeling the billionaire mindset, People like Richard Branson, who you see, he's having his troubles right now too with bankruptcies of companies. And so he, I mean, we're all hit by this stuff. And so, um, uh, but that doesn't make him, make him any less of a hero, you know? Um, 
So I think there's lots of heroes out there. And Warren Buffett, uh, who I, is another one that I really, really look up to from a financial perspective, says, tell me who your heroes are and I'll tell you what your life will be like. Yeah. And um, so I've had a number of uh, different heroes along the way and in different realms and different aspects of the game. Um, I've had business partners that I've done business with that I learned a lot from. Um, the uh, uh, number of different influences and I'm grateful to all of them. Yeah, wonderful. So what's next for Chris Howard? I know you've got your, I saw your wealth consciousness August 17th online training, which is awesome. What yeah, else is, is yep. are you writing any more books? Please write uh, another well, book. I mean, you know, books are interesting these days because people aren't going to bookstores and, yeah. um, you know, and um, there's a lot more leverage that can come out of doing an audio set and it takes a lot less time and there's a lot, more, you know, you can yeah. teach a lot more. And um, so I don't know. I mean, I might do, uh, and then the other issue with books is once you've written it in order to go back for rewrites and stuff is such, a, it can be such a challenge. Whereas, yeah. Uh, especially if you're publishing to a traditional publisher or something like that, you never know. I might, I might turn back to that at some point, um, but it's not, it's not the immediate, uh, uh, like what I'm building right now is an online infrastructure for delivering training. Um, we focus this year specifically, because over the years I've trained a lot of people to do a lot of different things. Um, yeah. We've done our fast track to success, which is what you went through where we had people coming in from, that wanted to build businesses, that wanted to become speakers, that wanted to become coaches, that wanted to reconnect with their loved ones or uh, you know, enhance their own performance. So people came through for every reason in the book. This year uh, with the pandemic, we started focusing in just on one niche of that, which is uh, speakers and coaches and just tra and focusing on building some great online education for speakers and coaches. Yeah. And we've done that. So we built uh, several different courses uh, that all are delivered online now. And we have a number of people going through those courses in that online infrastructure. And now I'm focusing on the wealth consciousness, which is um, so because I built that up for speakers. There's still tweaking to do with that, ameliorations to do with it, but it's there. It exists. Yeah. Somebody can get a very complete education just online to be a speaker or a coach and launch their business and make money. So I've got that. Now we're doing the wealth consciousness and I'm going to build up another infrastructure that's uh, purely more for the layperson or anybody that wants to transform their consciousness or break through their barriers. And so that's what I'm, I'm working on that one now. And then we'll have these two big infrastructures that sit out, out there and then we'll improve them more. And then maybe we'll add another element to it and then another element to it. And we'll just keep building that. Wonderful. What, what legacy do you want to leave, Chris? Um, you, you know, I've always said, and it's always, it came from my heart, but I've always said that I wanted to create worldwide wealth through education and entrepreneurial means. Um, and the fascinating thing is, is that when I was out there teaching on the, the, the seminar circuit, even when I had nine trainers that were out there training trainings for me with three different trainings happening at any given time in the world with hundreds if not thousands of people in each of those trainings we had 40 coaches around the world when i had all that going on it was doable to a certain extent moving to the online uh, platform in that way it's doable it's a lot more doable now yeah. to create a big goal like that because it's far more leveraged where we can reach people in every corner of the planet so uh i think going back to that concept of worldwide wealth through education and entrepreneurial means and and um, helping people to live their dreams and helping them to ameliorate their quality of life and helping people to um, uh, really be able to fulfill their dreams and to make it happen. And, um, and, and uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be happy with that. And it's something that we're already doing. The only question is how much can we expand it and how soon? Yeah. And the great thing is, you know, I say this to, to great coaches like yourself is that, it's such a, it's so exciting that there's this ripple effect that you yeah. can help one person and you may not even know, you know, before we met last year, you wouldn't have known that here's this person in Australia with your CDs listening and going, oh, maybe I'll learn about NLP, maybe I'll be a coach, you know, so, so you, there's all these people around the world that you don't even know that you've touched their lives and also the ripple effect that that has. I know for me, that really excites me to think, how many people can I help in this world? Right. And you're doing a fabulous job with that. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate it.
<laughs> now I've got some rapid fire JJ questions before we finish. Okay. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> All right. So what's the best piece of advice you've been given? Best piece of advice I've been given, um, always sell yourself. Love it. What's your favorite book? Um, the Alchemist. Who would play you in a movie? Tom Cruise. Tom, I, you know what? I was thinking that. Don't know why. Uh, what's one thing on your bucket list? Um, bucket list. Let's see. I've done them all. Um, I still want to go to the Seychelles. I haven't been to the Seychelles. Wonderful. You're, you're nicer than Tom Cruise, by the way. Just go back to that question. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. That's just my personal opinion. Um, if you trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? Oh, I might trade the trade with Tom Cruise too. That might be fun. Check out how <laughs> A nicer yeah. vision. Yeah. Um, <laughs> three words. Uh, I'll never get him on my podcast now. Oh, well. Ah. Three, <laughs> three words that describes you. Um, oh, driven, uh, visionary, and uh, uh, impassioned. If you could have five people that are currently, if they're dead or alive now, to have dinner with, who would you choose? Oh, my gosh. Um, let's see. I would have dinner with uh, Jesus, Bruce Lee, Elvis Presley. Um, who else? Who else? Who else? Jesus, Bruce Lee, Elvis Presley. Um, ah, who else? Oh, we'll throw Tom Cruise back in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just running out of people. I don't know. I don't know. And let's and you know put. What? Uh, and the other. What's thing, that? And the other thing is, I knew that you'd you'd like Elvis Presley too. Uh -huh. I don't know. It's just a vibe. <laughs> I love Elvis too. Absolutely love him. Um, and, and, oh, Martin Luther King Jr. MLK. Okay. If you yeah. could have one superpower, what would you have? <sighs> I think I'd probably have to fly. Love it. What TV sitcom family would you be a member of? Um, TV sitcom. Why did I go to cartoons? I went to cartoons first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went to like, uh, I think South Park and Eric Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> Oh, I love these questions. Oh, I, can, I have never said these questions and not laughed. I can tell you that much. Um, and the last one is, what is something that someone wouldn't know about you? Most people wouldn't know about you. Um, let's see. Something uh, someone wouldn't know about me. When I was a kid, I had a little pet frog and it leaped out of my hand and I stepped on it. Oh and, no. And I was so sad. Yeah. Oh no. And I love little frogs. They're so cute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, thank you so much, Chris, okay. for your time. I no really problem. do value that. And um, thank you for helping all the people around the world. I cannot wait to see you when you're back in Australia. I'd love to awesome. catch up with you when you're back in Australia. I know, um, we had a great dinner when you were here last time. So I'd love to catch up with you and thank you for all the work that you do. And uh, anyone that wants to get online, so just chrishoward.com. You can go to chrishoward.com uh, or you can go to uh, Speaking Grow Rich 365, which is a program that I just launched, uh, Speaking Grow Rich 365.com. And you can get a free one-year program that helps you to speak and grow your business and stuff like Wonderful. that. Wonderful. Thank you so uh -huh. much, Chris. And okay. um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to be creating in the future. Cheers. Thanks for that. Thanks. See you. Bye.